The famous artist, Bertie Rose, is who I'm joined by today. Very excited to talk to you. Um, We've talked before, but never um, just like as a one-on-one podcast recording. I think we talked in a group setting with some other turfy people, which was fun. But I also wanted to connect with you and like hear more about you and everything one-on-one. So thanks for stopping by. That's all right. Yeah, so um, so tell us a bit about what you've been up to lately. What kind of stuff are you working on right now? Oh, I've been drawing pictures. Have you seen the tarot card style pictures I've been doing? Yeah, I've seen a little bit on Twitter. Yeah, I've been doing those. So those are really interesting because I started it off with J.K. Rowling wrote a tweet that said something like, I hear karma's, they say karma's a bitch, but I hear she's a turf. And Ooh. I really liked it. So that came to mind. So I drew it like that mm-hmm. just because that, that's the vibe I got from it. Mm-hmm. Like with the tarot card, karma and all of that stuff. So I drew that and then people said, oh, you should do that. Like um, Nina Paley did the cards, the deck of cards. Maybe you should do a tarot card one. And I said, mm-hmm. nah, you're right, thanks. I don't want to do that. And then a few months later, I just started getting more and more ideas for what I could do for that. So it just, it just came it just came to me. I just do things nice. when they come to me, if that makes sense. Awesome. Yeah, completely. Do you feel like you have, like, a muse or anything like that as an artist? Um, is it cheesy if I say everything around me is a muse? Okay. Yeah. That no, is I mean, cheesy, I isn't like it? that. <laughs> I like that. I mean, does that that makes me think like could it be good or bad things that could yeah, it could be anything. You? Yeah, could be anything, yeah. good or bad. I feel like um, there's a lot of things that have gone on culturally around her that are mm-hmm. negative that have also been amused, and there's yeah. a lot of things that are positive that are amused as well. So yeah. I think the you know J.K. Rowling saying what she said made me laugh as well. So that's mm-hmm. quite funny, and that is amused, but it's also about a negative topic. So yeah, everything. Yeah, exactly. yeah, absolutely. I mean, sometimes it's it is the negative that can kind of fuel us even more because we don't want to just if, if it's the beautiful and the lovely in life, it's like we can just sit and take it in and enjoy it. It doesn't necessarily always put the fire under our butts in the way that something that we don't like can, you know, actually propel us forward in some ways or give us ideas. Yeah, and also I don't like being told what to do. So when yeah. I first started drawing the portraits and stuff Mm -hmm. the the more I got in trouble for it the more I wanted to do it because no you're not going to tell me what to do I can draw what I want yeah you're not going to say call the police on her because she's drawing a picture that's not going to happen you can say it but I'm going to mock you for it and then make art about it (laughs) yes perfect because I mean mockery is what these people need first of all I think so Yes. And what we need is for artists to not shy away from this topic. I mean, like how Graham Linehan has said, this whole topic is a goldmine for comedy. So, you know, it's, it's right a goldmine there. It's for art in general. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. It, no, it, it is just a goldmine. And mm-hmm. I don't understand how so many artists are not just shying away from it, but they won't go there and they're scared to. But at the same time, they talk to talk about, you know, like standing up for what's right and you know, the, all artists think they're rebels, and they're not. They're being so conformist. It's so embarrassing. That is such a good point. Artists are supposed to be the rebels, and yet, if you look at, like, the entire sort of liberal artsy community, I used to live in New York. I hung out with, like, a lot of Brooklyn artists and stuff, and they are so conformist on this and the whole woke politics thing, especially gender. I mean, it's, you know cult level status oh Um, definitely yeah yeah and there's no i i don't find any inspiration on their side like if if i was to be a trans activist i can't imagine what would inspire me artistically about that if that makes sense yeah no that's so interesting because it's also like if what you believe doesn't align with reality doesn't that kind of freeze your creative instincts in a way? Because you're shutting down your own ability to perceive and like correctly name what you see or identify what you see. Could I'm that agree sort of... and disagree. Mm. Okay. I'm going to say that I don't think it's necessarily that it 
I, I think your creativity could be stunted if your worldview is stunted. So I do think mm-hmm. that if you're, it's not about whether you live in reality or not, because a lot of art is about unreality. It's fantasy. It's True. dream world. And I love that art as well. But it is more about if you're going to limit your speech and your thoughts, you're going to limit your imagination as well, aren't you? Yeah, absolutely. If that's the inevitable outcome. You can't, you can't think outside of these labels and these boxes and this um, ideological world that we've created for you. So there is no going outside of that. If you're free in your thoughts, you can go outside of yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That sounds a bit wanky, but I reckon it's true. No, I like it. It's because you're closed off in a way, and it's the opposite of being open-minded. It's kind of like how I sometimes think about how when I was first canceled and everyone was calling me a bigot, and I had to go and look up the definition of bigot, not because I didn't know what it meant, but I just wanted to see because people are calling me this. I know I'm not this. And one of the main definitions of bigot is someone who doesn't tolerate other points of view. So the the bigots are really the people who, like you said, want to call the cops on you for your art or something like that. Have has people have people done that? Um, I think they have. They've because you're in England, public, so yeah. There's been this public whole hate calls. crime thing. The, well, the police haven't approached me about my art specifically, mm. but there have been public calls for uh, to match report me to the police for my art, and that was when I drew J.K. Rowling. Magdalene Burns and Posey Parker, Kelly J. Keen. I, I was about two or three portraits in, so I'd only drew, drawn a few. And, yeah, there was a mass call to, or a mass public posting, people saying that we need to, or everyone needs to call the police. And then there have been people locally. One guy is the hate crimes ambassador for the local police. He publicly wrote online that he's at, Absolutely annoyed that I have not been prosecuted yet. And Wait, I was who like, was this wow, guy? The hate. These... Oh, who was that guy? He's the hate crimes ambassador for the local police where I live, and I was just blown away because the, the of all the things to call the police on someone for drawing pictures is bad enough, but the fact that you're a hate crimes ambassador for the police and you're complaining publicly that I haven't been prosecuted, as if there are not actual criminals in the world to take care of. Wow. No, we got to go after Bertie Rose, the artist. My sure God. <laughs> that is insane. That is why I made the um, help arrest her. She's thinking thoughts I don't like. I made that picture because of that situation. And it was really my way of laughing at them. Yeah, that's perfect, honestly. That's unbelievable. That is so terrible. I mean, it gets bad, obviously, really bad here in the U.S., but thank God we don't have the situation you guys have where police can come to your door for, you know, a gender-oriented tweet. <laughs> I don't think that's happened yet here. People, you know, well, d- correct me yeah, you wrong. guys. You guys see free speech differently to we do. So we don't necessarily yeah. have free speech in the way you do, which surprised me because I just assumed we did. But especially when I was on the left, I just assumed we had free speech. And I was just mm-hmm. like, yo, free speech, I can say what I want. But actually we don't. And I've learned a lot from this. So we, with the hate speech laws and the hate, hate speech legislation, I think we've put ourselves on a slippery slope with that because that started out to in in theory protect or protect people who are of minorities like religious minorities or ethnic minorities um, or homosexuality and things like that but also I think it was to add to the crime when you're in court so the judge would take into consideration that the crime was racially motivated or you know, um, motivated as a crime against that person's sexuality. And I think what's happened is that's been extrapolated out of legal language and the courtroom and put into society. So now the police think it's their job to arrest you if you are, you know, racist or if you're against homosexuality and things like that. When I personally don't think that's an arrestable offence. I think if you commit a crime, you should be arrested. But if you have an opinion that is not necessarily nice or unfavourable in some way or even upsetting, I don't think that should be a police matter. 
but it is. Yeah. It is now. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's like, I agree. I, I'm obviously a free speech advocate. And I think even if someone's art, let's say, is abhorrent or even hateful, I would still support their right to create it. However, your art is obviously nothing in the, in, to do with that category. Um, but people who themselves are promoting this, you know, genuinely harmful ideology, of course, they're going to project onto something that's positive and something that's not malicious and say that that needs to be shut down because it's in a way exposing us, especially with, you know, mocking um, that makes them feel really defensive because it starts to yeah. push down that house of cards. I've been warned against mocking before um, and I have been told by friends close to me in my life that, you know, mocking is very dangerous and it can put you in a bad situation with a lot of these sort of types of personalities. But I also can't help myself. I can't resist. <laughs> I mean, I love that. Yeah, we need that. And um, that's an abusive uh, personality if they can't handle mocking, you know, to an extent. I think so. Um, you know, women especially who are speaking up for their own rights and reality and all of that stuff, they are mocked all the time. And we're supposed to just take it on the chin because, mm -hmm. you know, the people that are mocking us are kind and lovely. Right, exactly. They are the be kind brigade. So we are the evil witches. Yeah, pretty much. And, yeah, and they're um, on the right side of history, so they can't do any wrong. Yeah, that's the because funny thing. Because apparently... History gets judged in real time and not in the future by people that don't know us. Right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the thing, them thinking that they can say right now, we are on the right side of history when they are on the side of sterilizing children and, you know, the, tr the, the new homophobia and silencing women, getting artists fired. That has never been on the right side of history. So, you know, good luck to them. It depends what history you're talking about. Whose history? Is this? That's true. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, did you know Magdalene Burns, by the way? I did not. Okay. Yeah. No, I didn't. I did. Um, I had opportunities to go to the, I don't think it was called Let Women Speak back then. It might have been called something else, but there were gatherings and she went to them. And I did have opportunities, but we were living in our van. And we were on tour. So for me, it was always about logistics. Like whenever there was something happening in London, I wasn't in London. Whenever there was something happening in, I don't know, Manchester, I wasn't in Manchester. I was always somewhere else. And I regret that, to be honest. I've learned a lesson not to um, pass up on opportunities to do things like that. So last year, I went to Let Women Speak in Bristol, even though I live near London now, so I could just go to a London one. But I do make an effort, like, where I can. And I won't skip out on something just because it's a little bit far away, unless I absolutely have to, you know, like if I've got a family day or something like that. But I'm glad I've made an appearance at one of these meetings because I think it's good to see what it's all about. Um, I've had some local gatherings that I've organised and I've done and it is nice and I, I can tell that other people who don't do what I do because I express myself every day freely I say what I want I say what I think for the most part um, express myself in my art and I've tried and find different ways to express myself so it's it is a relief I would say for a lot of women especially and some men to be in a place where they can say what they think about this one topic that we're apparently not allowed to talk about. Mm -hmm. but yeah, there yep. is something to it, definitely. Yeah, definitely. When you're being silenced, it's that same thing you said. It makes you want to just keep saying it. I think a lot of us have that personality trait or just we've come to develop it in this situation. Um, have you dealt with, you know, TRAs, trans rights activists in your real life, like in person? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, not in person. I haven't like had anyone approach me to attack me to my face, but everyone who cancelled us were people we knew in real life that we used to be friends with, but we hadn't seen them for about three or four years by that point. And in that time, they had all decided that they're either trans, non binary, or queer of wow. some sort. So they've all become that. And we introduced them all to each other as well. So that was weird. So we introduced all these people. 
we sort of didn't see them for a few years because we weren't really gelling as friends anymore. And also, we were doing our own thing. We were on tour. But, yeah, and then those people were the ones that cancelled us, but lots and lots of people joined in because my partner's a musician, so he had a fairly big audience back then. And that it just spread like wildfire. It seems to be a case of whoever gets their first wins when it comes to the truth nowadays. So it doesn't have to be true. It's just whoever says it first is apparently the one telling the truth and they win. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. There's that expression so, like the truth, the, the lie gets three times around the world before the truth even gets its shoes on. Yes, yes, yes. That's, I've never heard that before, but that's exactly it. And mm-hmm. that's, a, that's how we got cancelled. We got cancelled by people that knew us, that had some sort of issue with us. We still don't know what the real issue is. In my opinion, it's used me not believing in this ideology as a weapon to beat us over the head with. Yeah, absolutely. Um, The bullies just feel emboldened. They feel like you said they're on the right side of history, so they can do anything. It justifies anything. Um, But it's such a dangerous mindset to go into because, you know, I would never descend into that mindset, even feeling as strongly as I do about this issue. I would never think, well, anything is justified for this pursuit. You know, there's always going to be limits. There's always going to be a baseline of how you treat other people that you disagree with. Totally agree. I mean, I had that conversation with my fella when um, Nigel Farage's bank got closed. Down. I think it got closed down and everybody tried to make out like it wasn't for political reasons, but it was. It came out that it was because of his beliefs. And um, a lot of people didn't seem to care because it's Nigel Farage. So he's like, a political he he was a politician at one point but now he seemed to be like the political commentator and he's very unpopular but a lot of people didn't care because they don't like him and when i vote online that i i don't agree with the banks doing this because it sets a really scary precedent banks should not be deciding our moral, morality our opinions our politics any of this stuff it's none of their business But a lot of people seem to be on the side of, well, it's Nigel Farage and I don't like him, so I don't care. You know, why, you know, ha ha. Sort of like the person we don't like is going down. And that, when things like that happen, I'm reminded that I am different to these people because I'm always aware that anyone could slip into a mindset of moral sort of like superiority and could do something bad. And I think about that often, like anyone could do something bad to another person if they think they're in the right. And then I sort of like stress test it when these situations happen. And I know that I would not advocate for someone I don't like to have their bank closed down because they have an opinion. So then I think to myself, well, I'm not like those people. So it doesn't happen to anybody. Do you know what I mean? Like I listened to Jordan Peterson talk about how everybody's capable of doing evil and, you know, people don't like to imagine themselves as sort of like the uh, gatekeepers of the concentration camps or the gulags and things like that. And I tried to imagine that sort of thing, like sort of um, thought experiment in myself. And I can't imagine it. So I think, oh, okay, am I one of those people that can't imagine myself being a bad guy? And that means that's even more dangerous because if I can't imagine myself being a bad guy, it means I could become a bad guy. And then I, like I said, I stress test it when these situations happen and I don't want people I don't agree with to be persecuted in any way. So then it makes me think, is that true then? Is it true that if you can't imagine yourself being a bad guy, then you could become a bad guy? Or is it just the fact that I'm checking myself often? And Hmm. people that do bad things don't check themselves. Yeah, yeah. Wow. No, that's that's actually really interesting because it's completely the thing you said about. um, I remember when I was in college and I was much more of a feminist than I am now. And the professor was talking about the um, I think it was about the Stanford prison experiments. I don't know if you've heard about this, where they would have. Yeah, they had these young men and they were like divided them up into prisoners and um, prison guards. And apparently the prison guards got really sadistic and cruel really quickly. The power went to their head. And I remember actually raising my hand and saying like, well, 
this was a sample of, you know, young white men. It doesn't necessarily represent other demographics. And the, and I wouldn't say that anymore as my comment. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and the professor actually said, um, and of course, that was something I had heard, like on Tumblr or something. Um, the professor said, you know, it's really dangerous when we try to exclude ourselves from the people who would do those things for any reason, because that kind of puts us into a trap of thinking, like you said, thinking that we, I, for whatever reason, am morally superior. And I think, but I think there's a big difference between that, between saying like, oh, well, because I'm part of a victim group, I could never do something like that versus just saying like myself right now, how like, who am I on an individual level, not because of my group identity, or because of any ideology that I have, which I think would justify things, because it's like the uber, you know, ideology over everything. So that's, I mean, that is a tricky one. And then, but in terms of, like you said, stress testing it with the people who are right there in front of you right now because we don't even have to go to hypotheticals it's like nope. who's out here supporting who's out here supporting atrocities right now yeah and it's surprising actually what you find because there's a lot of people you like me personally I could agree with on a lot of things and then every now and again something to happen and they would take a stance that surprises me if that makes sense mm-hmm. and it is interesting for example with this trans thing right so there's a lot of people that agree with me that men can't become women but like there's a lot of I don't know if it's TERFs or GCs but there's a lot of women in that that do subscribe to feminist ideology as well and I'll call it an ideology for now but they do subscribe to that and so that's where I butt heads with a lot of people that I actually agree with on things like men not becoming women by magic so I'll agree with that, but I won't agree things like, for example, believe all women, because I'm not going to vouch for someone I don't know, even if it's a woman, like just because I'm a woman doesn't mean I automatically have to have the sort of like girl code solidarity with all other women. And I don't agree with that. That's something that I'm starting to think about a lot more now as well, because like you said, you used to be more of a feminist. I don't think I ever was a feminist, but I definitely wanted to be a feminist, if that made sense, because I wanted to be in this like woman group and all the solidarity to all the women, because I do care. I do care when things are unjust for women and children, and I do care when things are unjust for men as well. So I'm kind of in this position of, I just care. I just care about things. But, oh, sorry, I just pulled my mic. Um, But then, um, what was I saying? So I've been I've been sort of thinking about stuff like that and talking about that a little bit more. I get a lot of pushback on it, though, because people don't like me talking about feminism in a negative way, because you have to praise feminism. You can't be critical of it. And that, that is that is what you were saying about putting your group can't do any wrong. Well, do we agree that women can't do any wrong? I don't agree with that. I can't get on board with that. So does that mean I can't be a feminist? Absolutely. It means I can't be a feminist. Yeah, so you mean that that does mean you can't call yourself a feminist? I can never call myself a feminist because I don't believe that women as a group can do no wrong. Right. Yeah. I, um, it's also this controlling attitude that can sometimes come from women who call themselves feminists. It's definitely not all of them, but I've noticed it. You know, they pop up. Yeah. And it's like, well, do you really want women to be able to think for themselves and be themselves? Or do you want them to fit in with what you think they should do? And then it starts to sound just like the, you know, archetype of the controlling man. Yeah. And it also sounds like trans activism to me. Um, But it's trickier than trans activism because trans activism, like I don't believe trans is a real thing. And I think that, People use the word trans to try and describe feelings that they have, but the the way it's used culturally and in our society is as if trans is like a a separate category of human, and that is not what it is. It's feelings and it's it's things that you know people think, and so with the trans issue, it's it's more complicated than that because with women, we're half the planet, we are half of the entire world, 
And how are we ever going to get on the same page? Like ideologically, you can't make all women get on the same page. So if there there must be like a version of feminism or there are fem I know there's feminists out there that believe that, that they're feminists and they support women and they'll they support like political causes for women, but they don't expect all women to go along with it or they don't expect all women to believe the same thing. And then you go online and the feminists are different. Right online, they expect you all to speak the gospel of feminism. Yeah, exactly. It really is a gospel, and it's like you said, they expect every woman to automatically be a feminist. And if you are not, that means you have internalized misogyny. And I was kind of like you. I wanted to be a feminist. I thought maybe it would help me because I thought maybe because I am more feminine, and you know certain interests that I have are internalized misogyny and that feminism could help me with that. But looking back, I think that is one of the other pitfalls of it where you you can use it as sort of like a self-help thing um, with this promise of like sisterhood and like total freedom from, um, it's always a danger when someone seems to pinpoint one single thing as the cause of all the problems, you know, that you've dealt with, yeah. whether it's like patriarchy or you know, whatever it is in any given ideology, but usually they they tend to demonize something that's kind of like the whole world outside them rather than um, trying to just live the best life that they can within the limits that we all have. Because, you know, another thing feminists oftentimes do is they'll try to go around the limits of biology and reality. Again, similar to the trans activists. I don't know if you have noticed or experienced this, but some, even like the radical feminists who are much more sensible than, of course, the liberal feminists, they'll, you know, denigrate certain things about women's bodies as well, because they think that almost we're chained by our biology, in a sense. Yeah, that's an interesting point as well. And also separating the feminisms is a good thing to do when talking about it. I keep forgetting that there's different strands of it because I talk about it as a whole but there are different strands I don't think most people understand that um yeah I do think they talk about it within the constraints of biology and I also think there's um this patriarchy thing I can't get on board with because I, I don't know what it is I like, like everyone I speak to patriarchy is we're sort of like metaphysically enslaved by men in some sort of way we're not physically enslaved by them, but we are like economically enslaved by men. And I look around at the men in my life because I come from a working class background and all the men in my life are always just working to provide for their family. And I look at those men and I just think you're not oppressing or enslaving or trying to keep me down in any sort of way. So it doesn't speak to me in my own life, if that makes sense. And that's one of the things I started to recognise early on when I wanted to be a feminist. And I remember thinking, well, I, I, there are some parts of feminism I do agree with. Like, there, you know, like when, I don't know if you had this in America, but in the UK, women used to have to have their husband or a male member of their family sign off on their bank so they could get a credit card and things like that. Yeah, we women don't that. have to. We yeah, women don't have to do that anymore, and I think that's great. But and things like rape crisis shelters for women, women's shelter, things like that, advocacy for trafficked women and children, I can get on board with all that stuff because I think it's needed. But then when we come trickle down to the bottom of the list that has now become the top of the list, which is things like men looking at you wrong. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's like yes. I, I can't get on, I can't apply that to my life. There's no situation in which I think I should be making sure men don't look at me the wrong way. Yes, and I think it's so, um, it's actually dangerous to teach young girls sort of to blur the line between what is actually really dangerous, unsafe, abusive behavior for men and what is actually something you can brush off and go about your day and not internalize and not, you know, have this big struggle over. Um, And then what else did you bring up about like, 
Yeah, there's plenty of issues with feminism that, like you said, I as well can completely get on board with. And it doesn't mean that I don't care about women's issues. I do. That's actually, you know, kind of my topic is women's issues. But I might tackle it from different angles than, you know, a lot of feminists might do from their ideological standpoint. Um, And the key thing is that I'm open to their opinions and their sides. Are they open to mine? It's the same thing with the trans activists, you know. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And the trans activists blame everything on TERFs and women in feminism, not all women do it, but a lot of women in feminism, especially online, will blame everything on men. So for a lot of women, even the trans debate is about men versus women whereas I see it as about personality types I see it as like a lot of narcissistic personalities of both sexes are latching onto this issue to abuse any power they might gain over others and I think that's more dangerous than men just not liking women yeah you know it's like there are so many women who push trans ideology of course and I'm never going to be the person saying like it's all women's fault or it's all feminists fault. It's not. It has many, many reasons that it came to existence. Um, There are some very bullying women out there who will try to get people canceled, get people fired. Um, In my case, it was a trans woman. So a man who initiated like the cancellation mob and everything. But, you know, lots of women took part in it. Um, Lots more women also stood up for me. So for which I was very grateful and men. But yeah, it's like you said, we have to evaluate people based on their personality and not based on their identity characteristics, because that won't tell you anything. Then you're trusting the wrong things. You're looking at the wrong things and you won't know how to discern who's actually a good person and who's trustworthy and who's not. Having said that, though, if somebody does have pronouns in their bios, I don't trust them. Oh, for sure. 100%. (laughs) pronouns in the bio we disregard don't trust them anything you say yeah Yeah, any of that stuff pronoun badges they them t-shirts i don't trust them yeah no absolutely because you never know are they just going along with it like the blue hair thing obviously they've made quite a conscious decision (laughs) although some people maybe are just trying to have fun but um but you know in this current context you 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 can tell i have had blue hair before Okay, and there you green go. hair. I've done it all, so I'm I'm kind of being tongue in cheek with it. Yeah. But yeah, they've yeah, ruined yeah. the colour hair for us. Oh, they've ruined it. But um yeah, especially with the pronouns thing, you when it comes to work, I can understand for some people why they put their pronouns in, although you know, at this point I might be willing to lose a job over it, but that's just because I already have. Um Yeah, that's your personality. <laughs> kicking in look I think um it's really dangerous precedent to set to put pronoun badges and we have like the lanyards people in the hospitals like the nurses and doctors wear them and I think what that does if if more and more employers were to make their employees wear those sort of thing it puts anybody who doesn't subscribe to this ideology on the outside so we're now the outsiders we're the we're the heretics that don't believe in the new religion of our country. And that is weird because we, there, there's never been a vote on do, do we want to stop being England and be transland instead? There's never been a vote on it, but we're acting like we do live in trans country. Yeah, I wonder if it's even worse over there. It's, it's Here it's really pockets, you know, like you'll go to city and it's like rainbow flags have puked up all over everything but also the trans flag so you know it's not just the the old-fashioned sort of like gay and lesbian rights it's really the this transgender monster popping up and like you said it's just become so ubiquitous and um just it's Like, you have the sense walking through it that you are on, like you said, you are on the outs just for not believing in this new ideology. Yeah, I think it's similar here. So in cities and built up areas, you're more likely to see this progress flag everywhere. Um, Outside of it, not so much. And I think what it is, is the people that do actually believe in this stuff are a minority. A lot of people feel compelled to go along with it. And I don't know if that's just like, polite English stuff like English people just being polite um but 
if you go outside in the real world and you were you were to walk around and ask people about it, most people, in my opinion, although I've not tested it, maybe I should, but most people would be okay with saying what a woman is, I think, or they would agree that this stuff is mad. Um, but I, th- I suppose some people might be afraid to answer any questions about it. I haven't stress tested that because I don't like go out much anymore. I go to the gym and that's pretty much it. Like I go to the gym, I occasionally go out to a gig or whatever. Um, everybody in the gym knows what a woman is, so that's pretty good. Yeah, it seems like there's so many people who I I haven't you know tested it either. I don't go up to random people and say like what is what do you think a woman is? But I have yeah. worn my shirt, my woman adult human female shirt. And, you know, at the grocery store and the cashier was like, I love your shirt. So yeah, I that get was that. Good. I wear my shirts yeah. all the time. Like, I wear yeah. my own shirts all the time because yeah. uh, it's easy for me to wear my stuff. But, um, yeah, I don't, I've never had anyone say, why are you wearing that? It's awful. I've never had anyone say anything like that to me. If anything, it's been compliments about my shirts, you know. So yeah, I think a lot of people... And my fella said something interesting. He thinks he he asked me actually if I think a lot of people assume that I just don't want people to be able to wear whatever they want. And I was like, that's a bit weird. That would be a weird thing to assume that that's what this whole argument is about. But then I've been thinking about it, and I wondered if that is what the what people think the argument is about. People think it's just about all oh, these bigots over here don't want people to wear whatever they want well maybe if they're really uninformed but the rabid people the people who go after you i think i i don't think they, they think better. that no, oh yeah, yeah. he oh, wasn't yeah. talking about them he was talking about mm-hmm. sort of people that aren't very informed they're not online they're not in the argument they don't really know what it's all about yeah um, i think i think he's way more charitable than me Mm-hmm. he's thinking along very charitable lines yeah yeah i mean <laughs> yeah <laughs> there's there are some people who are really well-meaning who who just have a very cursory if that's the right word cursory understanding just a surface understanding of this issue it's just not their issue they don't know a lot about it and all they know is that it is part of the gay rights movement and maybe they are you know someone who just supports equal rights, just supports gay people to live, you know, free of um, abuse and harassment and all that stuff. And it gets lumped in, but, and that's been done on purpose. You know, that's, that's so insidious. They've joined on to the gay rights movement. Um, And so people will absolutely think that you are, you know, homophobic, or you just don't like, you know, people expressing themselves differently or being gender non-conforming. It's, it's actually the complete opposite. That's what's so hard to get through to people who are well-meaning. It's like, no, they've done a reversal here. So it's not yeah. all the things they're saying it is. Yeah, I think it's difficult for people to understand that as well, especially if they have gay and lesbian people in their lives that support trans. Yes, yeah. That makes it, I mean, and then it's like, well, a lot of them do. So here we are. Yeah, and a lot of do. women do. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of women are especially interested in transitioning their children. Yes. Now I find that, that scary. That is scary. That is really, really scary. I mean, in some cases, I would definitely go as far as to call it child abuse. In other oh, cases, absolutely. yeah. I mean, it, at at worst is child abuse and at best it is just I was gonna say just extreme levels of stupidity but you know not necessarily I mean here's the thing you have to have some sympathy for they go to the professionals right like they go to the doctor they go to the therapist they go online for even for like accurate sources like healthcare sources like real sources not just twitter or reddit or whatever and yeah. everything is telling them that this is right, that this is the new science. This The ACLU is going to tell them that. Like, the government is going to tell them that. So there are definitely, a, there's a huge subset of parents who are be, are victims as well, you know, being bamboozled. But I think what you brought up was more the kind of self-centered mother who 
wants the attention, wants the glory of the trans child. And so yeah, they're she'll... the ones I think of first. But you are right, there are a lot of parents that are just worried and every source that is supposed to be a trustworthy and reputable, credible source is telling them that this is the thing to do. So there is that. And, um, yeah, I think there are a lot of parents that kind of think that have bought into this idea that their kids know something that everybody else doesn't, you know, mm-hmm. like their kid yeah. is enlightened in some sort of way. They've got this special knowledge that other people like me don't understand because I am too ignorant to look into it myself. Right, right, right. And it's very much wrapped up in their love for their kid and in their desire for their kid to be who they really are. But there comes a point, and I was just talking about this with Stephanie Davies Arai, who I interviewed, who is really, really good on all this stuff. She's an She's expert. She's great. Yes. I love her. Yeah. yeah, I love her too. And she is, you know, an expert on child communication or communication with children and with parents. And she's saying, like, there comes a point where it is so necessary to put those boundaries on kids to tell them no to not it's not always about being warm and fuzzy it's not about being mean and hard or cold at all but it's about realizing that they are not little adults they don't know better than we do we know better than they do unless you're a malicious adult in which case you should be kept (laughs) away from children but yeah um, of course But she said that there's actually a form of child abuse where the child is being treated as if it's an adult. So mentally, they don't have that capacity. That's why they need to be protected. And, you know, she says in parenting advice in general, that's been lost. And it's all about let the child lead and listen to what the child tells us about themselves. That is the weirdest thing ever. Because, like, I don't have kids, but I do look after our nieces and nephews. And I could not imagine what our day would be like if they were in charge of it. It's just not hey. going to happen. I mean, I know my three-year-old niece wants ice cream for breakfast. Sometimes she gets it if I'm feeling like I want ice cream too, and then I can't justify saying no. But she's not going to get that every time she comes around there. You know, there's, yes. there are things you have to say no to for their own protection as well. Exactly. And especially if they're saying something where it's not on par with reality it's it's not um part of reality i mean like if you've got a little boy saying i'm a girl you don't say oh really tell me more you know what's this wisdom that you've tapped into that i have no idea it's like no honey you're you're a boy and that's okay and if you want to wear the tiara when you play dress up with your sister that's fine like let's have fun there's nothing wrong with that um but yeah you're a boy. I, mm-hmm. I couldn't imagine saying yeah you're a girl I know. Well, yes, I know. you're you're definitely the opposite sex because you said so. I couldn't imagine it. I know. It's crazy. It's it's so insane. It's like if your kid had brown hair and said to you, like, I have blonde hair. And then you just say, okay, sweetie, yeah, you do. Like, no. You, you correct them because they're learning. That's the thing. They're yeah. trying to learn about the world. It's very, it must be very disorientating for children. Disorientating? For children who um, are trying to learn about the world around them, they need that to be reality based, really. I mean, I know kids love fantasy, right? So they've got their Disney films and things like that. But the fun of that is you get to dive into that world, but you, you understand reality. And that's what makes that world fun. Does that make sense? So yes, the idea that you're going to blur those lines, it must be really confusing for children. Yeah, it must be confusing and stressful, like, and just add to the issues and the anguish. And like you said, they play, they they have a whole play fantasy world. And it's beautiful. That's why kids are so, you know, it, it's so adorable and innocent and pure to us, because we lose a lot of that as we get older. But like, I used to babysit this three year old, and we would play with Play-Doh and he wanted he we would make, you know, pizza pies with the Play-Doh. That nice. Was the game. And so then, you know, he would take the pizza pie and he would look at me and he would go to eat it. And I'd be like, we just pretend we don't really put it in our mouths. And he would get that. That's easy for him to understand. It's just play. He can understand the separation between he would do it to test me almost, you know, to see if I was going to stop him. And so I would stop him and then we would just go back to playing. He could understand that. But um, you have to remind them of those things. And that's exactly what they're what they're out here to learn every single day. They're trying to figure that out. 
And that's the thing, if you had eaten that Play-Doh, then he would now feel compelled to eat the Play-Doh too because the grown-up's done it. And now this is a kid that eats Play-Doh. Yeah. yeah. You know? And that yeah. Is, that is how, yeah, that is how it happens, I think. It's the grown-ups. Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. And if you have, like, you know, forget about watching watching me eat Play-Doh. What if he's watching his parents, like, yell at each other, scream at each other, you know, hurt each other, lie to people, you know, all kinds of things. And they grow up, they absorb that. We know that about humans and about children. Yeah. And they are little sponges. So to tell are. them, yeah, to tell them, like, listen, there's this, you know, if you feel like a girl, that's something we can make happen. That's something we can do with with medicine, and they tell they're gonna believe you. Yeah, that scares me though. All of that creeps me out. And also, I made a um, sticker, and it says it says chest binding, but in sort of like those marks um, is child abuse. And then I wrote underneath it's no different to uh, breast ironing and things like that. And one of my friends said to me, one of my personal friends said that that was the most difficult sticker for her as a parent to look at and I was like wow that's really interesting because and I guess what she's coming from a place of if there is a parent who is thinking that they have to choose between you know a dead child or a trans child they would see chest binding as a sort of like compromise on what this kid wants at least I'm not getting them surgery we'll do this for now maybe she'll grow out of it and so for me to say it's child abuse, I suppose it is hard hitting for some people. But I still can't, and this is a big but, I still can't wrap my head around why you would allow your child, your developing child, to do something like that. Because that binder has got to come from somewhere, and that's going to come from the adults. Yeah, I can't wrap my head around it either. Um, you know, another thing Stephanie Davies or I said is that there are really no small steps when it comes to transitioning a child because she called me out because I said like you know the small steps of just social transition pronoun and she was like well that's not a small step that's putting the kid on the path um and you know the binder thing it's so sad because these girls don't know what they're doing to themselves in the future they're as teenagers they're only thinking about right now they're thinking about the binder thing. They're trying to feel safe. They're trying to feel, you know, covered up and like hugged almost and like protected. And they're trying not to get attention with their breasts that we all have yeah. to learn to deal with. That's this like it can cause a lot of anguish. It can cause, you know, all, yeah, all sorts well, of things. Yeah, I can totally understand girls that are not ready to develop yet. And and boys as well, like nobody. But then again, that that's something that happens throughout your life. Like I'm not ready to get old yet, but I have no control over it. I'm not yeah. ready to be like. Uh, if you had this conversation with other women before, like at what point do you start calling yourself a woman and actually mean it? Because I didn't really call myself a woman until my thirties, and that's what I really like. Mm, I have to call myself a woman now because I am definitely like an old lady yeah I've um I've never I, I don't advocate for this idea that we should halt puberty and I know that's not what puberty blockers do but that is the argument and even if we did have a magic pill that we could halt puberty for children I don't know if that would be the right thing for them anyway because throughout the rest of their life they're going to be expecting to be able to put something else on hold until they're ready and you can't because the world doesn't stop for you. That's a great point. I never thought about that. This is not just a one, uh, a one-time thing for them. They're they're it's learning. It's not the one step. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're learning that you know reality time can be like you said, pause in their minds. Um, pause. That's the lie that's being fed to them. Um, mm -hmm. All kinds of things like that. It's so bizarre. And I mean, it's taking us outside of what nature intends for us we don't have control it's like you said we don't have control over aging we don't have control over getting older a lot of kids don't want to grow up they're scared of growing up they have peter pan syndrome you know and, and we have to teach them that it's scary but it's okay and you know i like jordan peterson too so i'm glad you brought him up he i recently <laughs> heard him say something about how as a psychotherapist 
it's not about because he he was a psychotherapist or is i don't know um it's not about teaching people to be less afraid it's about teaching them to be more brave and he said that's a huge difference it is a big difference Mm -hmm. it is and also if you're afraid then that means i heard this somewhere might have been jordan peterson might not have been because I listen to so much when I'm painting and when I'm in the gym and when I'm cleaning, when I'm doing everything, I'm always listening to something. And I heard someone say that if you're afraid and you're worried about the past or the future, your present is pretty good. Hmm. And that hit me as well. So I was like, a lot of worry and a lot of fear means that you're missing out on what's happening right here, right now. Yeah. And one day you'll look back and go, do you know what? It was all right then. And I spent all that time worrying. Yes, absolutely. Because that's what our brains do is they detect a fear or something that is not in our current environment. So we become disconnected from our bodies. We get up in our heads and we think there's something to be afraid of, something to be stressed about. And um, that disconnect from the body is so encouraged by trans ideology. I agree. And it's all of our scary. culture, actually, we have this yeah. like mental health culture mm-hmm. where everybody's talking about mental health and nobody's doing anything except for maybe making it worse. Yeah. And yeah. it is. And I've been a part of that in my own because that's been my generation has been doing that. And I have all my life like felt like oh I suffer from this I suffer from that and I do but is it a mental health issue or is it just me inflicting suffering on myself does that make sense so I have that conversation with myself all the time and because but we have it in our language so people say I'm really depressed so instead of saying I'm depressed today I say to myself I'm feeling a bit sad and um that could go come and go at any time so get on with your day yeah got things to do and I talk to myself like that like come on you're feeling a bit sad so what you know and sometimes I do allow myself to feel sad if I'm feeling sad because I think it's really bad for you to push that down so I allow myself okay I'm feeling sad maybe I'll put a sad song on and go to the gym because I know the gym makes me feel better but I let myself add the the sad song if that makes sense so uh, while I'm indulging I'm preparing to get better within the next hour or two if I can and I think there's um, a real blurring of the lines between significant mental disturbances and emotional disturbances and I think we have emotional disturbances or can have emotional disturbances at any point at any time any day for any reason and they come and go that doesn't mean that you're having a mental disturbance like a long-term significant mental illness and I think people think that they have a mental illness because they're anxious sometimes but they don't look at why they're feeling anxious like I feel anxious after I've eaten sweets is that because I'm sensitive to sugar rather than I'm mentally ill Mm -hmm. yeah yeah absolutely I mean it's it's so like what you said about you feel sad and so you're like okay I feel sad right now but I'm gonna do things that I know are gonna make me feel better that are good for me and that's the key to it is like taking action is what fixes it not sitting and ruminating and thinking about it oh Mm -hmm. my god because I am such a glutton for my feelings and Mm -hmm. if I'm feeling sad I'm so tempted to just like sink into it and let it swallow me up because I I might be because I'm an artist and artists are a little bit weird like that because you swallow up all the sad feeling and be sad but before I know it I've not got out of bed I've not had a wash I've not brushed my teeth I've not done anything and I can see how people spiral and they just get swallowed up in it and I don't think the way to deal with it is to constantly talk about how depressed you are and tell yourself you're... Because when you say it out loud, you're like manifesting it as well. So you're telling yourself you're depressed while you're depressed or while you're feeling depression. And um, I don't... I, I could be talking shit because I am not at all in any way educated in any of this stuff. I'm just talking from my experience. The best thing to do is to put things in place that make you better and I don't see that in our culture at the moment I just see this constant doom and gloom and glorifying of doom and gloom and how awful everything is and how mentally ill everyone is and that there's no sort of encouragement towards 
what are the things you can do that will make you feel better? And it might not cure your sadness, but it will get you through the day. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, 100%. Like, we have our emotions. The emotions aren't the bad part. Like you said, you let yourself feel sad, but you don't make it who you are. Like, you don't make it your identity. Like, everyone has those bad emotions but then we also have good emotions at other oh times oh god i'm just trying to imagine who i would be if i made that my identity yeah it's a nightmare <laughs> I'm just, like horrified like it's a nightmare yeah, yeah 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 definitely like it's it's not ideal to make that's the other thing we're making a lot of things that are labels into our identity and i would like to think of myself as a 3d person that has lots of parts to me rather than a label that you can just read a list of all the things about me and that's it and it all connects to that label I'd rather be a whole person yeah absolutely that is so lost in our culture where you are this you are that you are an ace pansexual polycule so you're you left know. wing you're right wing you're mm-hmm. feminist you're anti-feminist it's like why can't i just have lots of opinions yeah exactly why can't i just decide on each in- individual issue rather well, than we, you know what mm-hmm. we can which won't be that popular right exactly <laughs> we'll just get cancelled from all sides from all yeah, sides why not why not yeah. go big or go home yeah yeah, you might as well. That's true. You might yeah, as well. Yeah, you might as well. When you get cancelled the first time, it's like absolutely devastating. And yeah. then afterwards, you go, you like sort of, it's like being swept out to sea and you think you're drowning. And then slowly the tide comes back in and you're like, oh, look, there's a little bit of sand and I can build a castle on it. And oh, look, the sun's shining. And oh, look, I know when the tide's coming in and out and I can tell it to fuck off. And at some point it will. And you start to realise you do have control over your environment, even though I'm not suggesting that anyone has control over the sea because you absolutely don't. But you do have control (laughs) over how much you're willing to get cancelled and how much you're willing to affect let it affect you like for example you can get cancelled and lose your job and that is genuinely devastating and that is genuinely difficult and that is going to be a huge event that turns your life upside down but you can also do something about it afterwards just like the sad feeling come and go you can put things in place to build yourself back up and put your put your life back together and we've done it we've put our lives back together and on the other side of it there's so much freedom because I just think, do you know what? If anyone cancels me, I, it's not going to be a cancellation because they're not allowed to. I'm not going to allow it. And you can't cancel me anyway because I work for myself. So fuck you. Yeah. Beautiful. Perfect. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> fuck you to those people. And um, and another thing Jordan Peterson said was that um, if you are in that situation and you don't want to get fired which i also don't advocate for people to just go out and get fired um, i don't think so either i don't yeah. think it's wise you got to be right. you got to be wise with this sort of thing yes yes and he i was wasn't saying, wise <laughs> oh okay really you just I went you no, just threw I, it well, all I out there know, i i didn't know what it was i didn't know what cancel culture was mm. i didn't know what i was getting myself into So when it happened, I felt like I had to learn what was happening to me, why it was happening to me and what was actually going on. Like I knew you weren't allowed to say that women don't have penises and things like that, but I didn't know about what the consequences would be. So I learned, I think if I could go back, there's a number of things I would have done differently. There's a lot of regrets, but also with those regrets, I've taken a lot of knowledge from it. So I don't really genuinely regret it in my heart anymore, if that makes sense. But what did Jordan Peterson say? Um, So he had said that, you know, if you're in that position with um, you're in a job that you don't want to lose, you know, you don't want to lose your job, but you do want to speak up for a truth that you're seeing being denied. He said, just take or well, this also applied for people who just don't like their job um, and are stuck in an unhappy situation. He said, just take the smallest possible step, open your resume and just look at it. And then maybe the next time go in there and work on it and change it and, you know, take those incremental steps to yeah. figure something else out. I remember out. this. Yeah. Yeah. He's, I went to see him last year in London. Oh, wow. I got tickets to see him and mm-hmm. tickets got given to me. So I was really happy about that. Nice. And um, it wasn't in London. It was in Manchester. So I went to see him and he did talk about that. And he said about how you need to make steps, you know, like make maybe spruce up your resume and look for another job and all this stuff. But also make a stand for yourself, but know that you've got a backup plan. And that's what exactly what I would recommend for anyone who's, who 
is worried about being cancelled, make sure also that you have your support network around you, you know, that you have people that understand your position and respect your right to think what you think and say what you want to say and truly respect it and be there for you if needed. I don't think, because I didn't know any of this stuff, I didn't make sure there were people in our lives that would be there for us. So we felt truly abandoned and that can be even more devastating. So you want to get people lined up you know, to be in your corner. They don't have to come out publicly for you. Just be in your corner and be like, are you okay? Do you want to catch up and have a coffee? And make sure you don't go insane from it as well. Because that's yeah. what they want. They want you to go mad. They want mm-hmm. you to go mad and run into a corner and hide there forever because you're too broken. Exactly, because then they don't have to deal with the points you're making, which are so much better than their points. And... um I should have asked you this in the beginning, but what year did you get cancelled? When did that all first start? Um, My first cancellation was 2019, and then the big cancellation came a year to the day later. Okay. Yeah, and it's all the same people, so it's it's pretty organised. I mean, every year on the day, they do something online about me. Yeah. All right. Well, you know what? Those people are so... Sad. They are so sad. They are pathetic um they have they know deep 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 down they know but it's not something they can bring up to the surface but they know what they're doing on a certain level i'm not saying these people are actually aware that they are the bad people but i think they are okay yeah i think i think it's 100 percent possible that people are aware that they're bad and they're doing bad things and they don't care yeah yeah there it are gets people them what who they just want. don't care. Exactly. It gets them what they want. They get this rush out of it, too. Mm-hmm. This sadistic rush out of it. They feel powerful. Um, it's so gross. It's so disturbing. It really is repulsive. Yes, it really is. Oh, God. I'm getting the visceral repulsion <laughs> yeah, at these oh, people like... who try to cancel <laughs> us. Yeah, exactly. Like, get a life. Oh, my God. Um, well, we've, we've talked now for a whole hour and I have had so much fun. I've loved talking to you. Um, I want to tell everyone out there to go check out Birdie's work, go support her, buy some art. It's really awesome. She actually drew me when I was canceled, which was so exciting and cool and unexpected and flattering and just like awesome. So yeah, definitely go, go support her work, get some art, wear some t-shirts around, see what happens. Most likely no one will, you know, say anything because I even wore the shirt, you know, when I was in a little bit of a feisty mood, I wanted somebody to come confront me just so that I could be like, no, you know, I know what a woman is. It didn't happen. Yeah. It didn't happen. I wore, I wore this one, my notorious bigot shirt. I okay. wore it to the gym and mm-hmm. I was like, somebody's going to say something. And I was like doing all my weights and I was on the cardio machine and I was doing all this. And I was like, if anybody says anything, I'm ready. I'm ready. Right. And everybody was right. like, nice shirt. I really like your shirt. And I was like, exactly. Thanks. <laughs> That's so funny. I'm glad I'm not the only one. I was like, yeah, let somebody try to talk to me today. I'll tell them. And then it's like, everyone's just smiling at me. So yeah. that's, yeah. yeah. It's, it's weird, isn't it? It's, it's very, um, you know, people, I, I know I'm not going to try and hold you up, but you know, like this cognitive dissonant thing people talk about, we're kind of living in it, aren't we? Because yeah. there's there's this whole narrative, all this noise in our society about how you're not allowed to say that people can't change sex. But you see people and everybody's just like, yeah, well, they can't. Right, exactly. Everybody knows <laughs> they can't. Everybody yeah. knows who birthed them. You know, we all know. We all know. It's like the emperor's new clothes. I always Absolutely. bring that up, but it's so accurate. I never understood that story when I was a kid, but now I've learned. Because I used to get, when my parents used to read it to me, I used to get annoyed. I'd be like, but why is nobody telling him he's naked? <laughs> That's like so that. cute. <laughs> and I never understood it. And then over the last few years, I've understood it because everybody compares it to Emperor's New Clothes. And I was like, oh, so I've always had this personality. This is just yeah. who I am. Yeah, like, you would have been the kid. Going, I'm the one going, why is nobody saying it? Yes, you would have been the kid in the story who who broke the spell. Because in the story, it was a kid who laughed. It was laughter. The kid laughed at the naked emperor, and then everybody else could could relax and laugh, too. 
absolutely Isn't that funny that story is so so relevant <laughs> i think so as well yeah i, so I, I can't mockery. believe it I can't believe it either. And it's really about like a man parading his stupid body in front of us as well, which is a little bit uncannily accurate. <laughs> it's very weird because a lot of these men just look like Mrs. Doubtfire and we're <laughs> supposed to pretend that they look like yeah. Paris Hilton or something. Right. I, I'm showing my age now. I don't know any of the celebrities. <laughs> Who's yeah. a celebrity? I don't know. Kardashians. Yeah, Kardashians, you know, all those, all those idiots. But yeah, they look like Mrs. Doubtfire, but less wholesome somehow. Yeah. You know, something a little well, more skeezy. Well, Robin Williams was a wholesome guy, right? Mm -hmm, right. So. Yeah. <laughs> These guys are not wholesome. Oh, it's no. just creepy, creepy. It's horrible. Um, But let's leave it at that for now. And hopefully yep. you'll come back for another time. I would love that. I really enjoyed this chat. So. Definitely. Thank or you so maybe much. I'll have you on my channel and that gives awesome. us a chance to chat again. Yeah, and I can ask really you fun. questions. Perfect. All right. Sounds good. Excellent. All right. Thank you. All right then.